Good morning, everybody. During the last lecture and before the last lecture in chapter four and in chapter five, we have seen forces acting on the objects. And today we will discuss the relation between the forces and work and the forces and kinetic energy. So we will learn what it means for a force to do work on a body and we will learn the definition of kinetic energy, energy of motion of a body, and we will also investigate the relation between the work and kinetic energy. So in the next lecture, we will use the relationship between total work and change in kinetic energy when the forces are not constant. The body follows a curved path for example. And as a last topic of this chapter, we will deal with the problems involving power. Power is the rate of doing work, and we will finish this chapter. So here you see a baseball, and there is a baseball pitcher, and he does work with his arm, his throwing arm, to give the ball a kinetic energy, okay? So at the beginning, this ball is at rest in the hand of this baseball pitcher, okay? The kinetic energy of this ball is zero, and then pitcher throws this ball by applying a force with his arm, then with this force, this ball gains a kinetic energy. So within this chapter, we will learn new concepts, work, energy, conservation of energy, okay? And these terms, this new information will be very helpful for us when we are dealing with problems in which Newton's laws alone aren't enough. So very useful chapter and I would like to remind you that you will use information from chapter one vectors. You will use information from chapter two and three, motion along a straight line and motion in two or three dimensions. You will use the equations for constant acceleration. You will use the equations for non-constant acceleration situations and you will also use Newton's laws of motion, okay? So all the previous information will be used and will be very helpful also for this chapter. So here we have an example. There is a car and there's a snow on the road and these guys are applying a force on this car. So a force on a body on this car does work if the body undergoes a displacement. So let's consider that they apply force, but the car does not move. Then there is no work on this car, okay? But if the car has some certain displacement, one meter or two meters, okay, then the force applied by these guys does work on this car. So here we have the relation. Let's consider this is a surface and there is a box here, there is a body. Let's consider this is car or something else. And someone applies a force to the right side, okay? And then due to this force, the box has some certain displacement of, of S. And what about the direction of the displacement? The direction of the displacement and the direction of the force are same along the positive X direction. So the work done by this force on this body is given with this expression. Work is shown with capital W symbol, which is equal to force times s. This s here is displacement, okay? Final position 
of the object minus initial position of the object. This is displacement and this is the force applied on the object. So what about the SI unit of work? It is in Joule, okay? And you can write it like this. This is the equation for work. Here we have one Joule and it is equal to force times displacement. And we know that the unit of force is given with one Newton and the displacement is given with meter. And then one Joule is equal to one Newton times meter. Here we have a caution from the book. For the work, we use this symbol with capital W, let's say, okay? But in case of weight, in the previous chapters and also for the forthcoming chapters, we use this lowercase w, okay, for the weight. So work is bigger, so don't confuse. Okay, then let's discuss the work done by a constant force. Here, there is a car and there is a man here. This man applies a force on this car along this direction with some certain angle, okay? And with this force, the car has some certain displacement. The car moves through this axis, let's say, and this is the displacement of the car. And what about the work done by this guy? I can write this force in terms of its components, vector components, okay, from chapter one. So this is the angle phi, and this is the F parallel to the displacement, which is given with F times cosine phi, and this is the F perpendicular to the displacement, force times sine phi. So what do you see here? This force, this perpendicular force to the displacement. This is the displacement direction, and this is the force direction. So this perpendicular force does no work on the car, okay? Because there is no displacement in this direction. We have only displacement in this direction. So if there is no displacement, then the work is zero. So along the displacement, we have this force F times cosine phi. So if you write the work equation here, F parallel times displacement, F parallel is given with F times cosine phi times S, then work is given with this expression here. Work is given with F times S times cosine phi. Phi is angle between F and S force and displacement. So what we have learned here, the perpendicular force, perpendicular to the displacement, does no work on the objects. Only the force, only the parallel component of the force does work on the objects, okay? Look at this equation. You can write this expression in this form. Remember the vectors. Remember the scalar product of vectors or dot product of vectors. This equation can be written with this form, F dot S, okay? So this can be written also in this form, F S times cosine phi. Remember the vectors in chapter one. Here, force is a vector. It has certain direction and magnitude and displacement is also a vector. It has certain direction and magnitude, but what about the work? This is the scalar product and scalar product gives us a scalar number. So the work is a scalar. Don't forget, okay? Work is a scalar independent from the direction it has just some certain numbers. And important thing here is that this work can be positive, can be negative, or can be zero. Look at the cosine phi here, okay? Depending on the phi angle here, between the displacement and the applied force, this work can be positive, 
negative or zero, depending on the phi angle. We will discuss these things. Now, let me give you one example, bio application. So we have many students within this lecture from different fields of science, from biology, from molecular biology and genetics, from bioengineering, also from the chemistry, from chemical engineering. So sometimes maybe you ask yourself why we are learning physics, okay? We are biologists. So, and then for each chapter, I am giving a bio application of the physics, okay? Which you are learning within this course. So physics is also important for biologists, for medicine people, okay? So also very useful for engineers in the other fields of science. So here, what is the relation between the work and muscle fibers? Here you see muscle fibers within our body, okay? Our ability to do work with our bodies comes from our skeletal muscles. The fiber-like cells of skeletal muscle shown in this micrograph can shorten, causing the muscle as a whole to contract and to exert force on the tendons to which it attaches. Let me draw something here. Let's consider here we have a muscle cell. And let's consider here we have a tendon. Okay, this is just representation tendon. And this is muscle cell, muscle cell. Okay, so what it says, it can contract it can shorten, okay? This muscle cells can shorten. So here in that condition, it has certain length. So if it is shortened, then this muscle cell will apply a force in this direction on tendon, okay? So then due to this force, there will be displacement of this tendon, then this muscle cell will do a work on tendon, okay? With this property, we can walk, we can move. So very important for our life, work and force relation. So let me continue. Muscle can exert a force of about 0.3 Newton per square millimeter of cross-sectional area. The greater the cross-sectional area, the more fibers the muscle has and the more force it can exert when it contracts. So this is the bio application for the relation between work and force in our body in muscle fibers. So now, let me discuss the situations for the work. As I told you in the previous transparencies, this work can be positive, can be negative, and can be zero, depending on the phi angle between force and displacement. So within this transparencies, we will discuss these situations. Here, we have an object, and then we apply a force in this direction. So we have some phi angle between force and displacement vector. So I can write this force in terms of parallel and perpendicular components of force according to the displacement vector, okay? Then what we have here, the direction of the S displacement, the direction of the force and the angle between the displacement and parallel component of the force. So this is the, this blue one is the direction of the displacement. This red one is the parallel component of the force. So then the work is positive because this relation here on the right side gives us the positive number. Now let's have a look, negative work case you are pulling this box with some certain force, with some certain angle, but the box is moving to the right side. 
Let me draw here. Let's consider that this is an inclined road and there is a box on the road and then you are pulling this box. OK, you apply this force on this box. But box moves in this side because your force is not enough. OK, so this placement, let's say this was the initial position X1 and here now we have final position. So this is the direction of the displacement vector. OK, S. So the direction of the force perpendicular to the displacement is this one, anti-parallel. This is perpendicular component of the force. So what do you see? Parallel component of force applied by this guy on this object is anti-parallel with the displacement vector, okay? Then, what about the phi angle? Phi angle is 180 degrees, then the work is negative. So, please always keep in your mind, if the direction of the force and if the direction of the displacement are opposite, then the work is negative. Do we have any question here? OK, let me discuss the last situation. Good. When the force is perpendicular to the direction of the displacement, the force does no work on the object. Here we have an object and we apply a force which is perpendicular to the displacement. So this is the initial position of the object and this is the final position of the object. So the displacement direction is this one, but you apply force in this direction. So there is no displacement in perpendicular direction. So then the work done by this force is zero. So what you see here, the direction of the force and direction of the displacement and the angle in between is 90 degrees. OK, so the work is zero, but Let's consider that you are applying a force on this box. This is the initial position and this is the final position. OK, now you have some certain displacement, but here displacement vector and force vectors are parallel to each other. They are not perpendicular here. We have displacement in this direction. The box is moving to the right, let's say, with some certain velocity. But you apply force perpendicular to the displacement and there is no displacement in this direction. We have only displacement perpendicular to the applied force. For this reason here, we have zero work. Any question? So with this zero work, here I have an example. This guy is a weight lifter and this is the barbell, this one. This guy, this weight lifter does no work on a barbell as long as he holds it stationary. So the position of the barbell does not change. The weight lifter exerts an upward force on the barbell, okay? but there is no displacement. Remember the work formula. The scalar product or this one. F S cosine phi. What about displacement? Here there is no displacement. Final position and initial position of the barbell is same. For this reason, displacement in this equation is same. So there is no work on this barbell, OK? Because the barbell is stationary. Here we will discuss another situation, lowering the barbell to the floor. So this guy, weightlifter, lowers this barbell to the floor. So this is the initial position of the barbell, and this is the final position of the barbell, Y2. This is the displacement, okay? 
So the direction of the displacement vector is this one. Then what about the work done by barbell on the weightlifter's hand? I'm looking for the work done by the barbell, okay? So barbell has certain weight, right? And then this barbell applies a force in downward direction on the hands of this weightlifter, okay? Then this is the direction of the force applied by barbell on the hands of the weightlifter. Then since the direction of the barbell force and the direction of the displacement are same in the same direction, then the work here is positive done by the barbell. But what about the work done by this guy, weightlifter? Weightlifter applies a force in this direction. So this is the force applied by the hands of weightlifter on barbell, but this goes in this direction because we are investigating this movement, okay? At the beginning, this weightlifter was holding this barbell at stationary and then he put this barbell to the ground, to the floor, okay? Then now let's investigate. This is the force applied by this weightlifter on barbell and this is the displacement of the barbell since the direction of the force applied by the weightlifter and the direction of the displacement are opposite to each other, then weightlifter's hands do negative work on the barbell. Any question here with this example or you can ask other situations. Okay, then let me continue with example. Work done by several forces. Here you see a tractor and here you see a sled and this sled is loaded with firewood, okay? A farm hitches her tractor to a sled loaded with firewood and pulls it a distance of 20 meter along level ground. So this is the initial position of the sled and this tractor pulls this sled 20 meter, okay, along level ground. The total weight of sled and its load is 14,700 Newton. This is the uh, weight of this sled and its load. The tractor exerts a constant 5,000 Newton force at an angle of 36.9 degrees above the horizontal. This is the direction of the force. It's 3,500 Newton friction force opposes the sled's motion. Find the work done by each force acting on the sled and the total work done by all the forces. Here we have many forces. So just draw the free body diagram for the sled. This is the weight of the sled, which is given in the question. And this is the normal force applied by the surface to the sled, okay? And this is the force, tension force, applied by tractor, okay, with some certain angle. It is also given in the question. And this is the friction force opposite to the movement of the sled, okay? Then what about the work? The work along the y-axis is zero because this sled does not move along the y-axis. It is moving along the x-axis, okay? So since there is no displacement along the y-axis, this normal force does no work. This weight does no work, okay? So what about this tension force applied by the tractor? This has parallel component to the displacement 
And this has perpendicular component. This force has two components. Let me draw. This is the parallel component of the force applied by tractor. And this is the perpendicular component of the force applied by tractor. So this perpendicular component does not work on the sled because, what about displacement? There is no displacement along this axis, okay? So only this parallel component of the force and the friction force, kinetic friction force, do work on this sled, okay? So then this is the new situation. Here we have a force, parallel component of this force applied by tractor, and we have an opposite force, kinetic friction force, okay? So we have two forces. Then the displacement is in this direction, final position, initial position. So what about the work done by this force? What about the work done by this force? Just use this expression, F times S times cosine phi. For this one, you have to write F parallel times S, what is cosine phi? The angle between this force and also this displacement is zero, then this will be one. This is F parallel times S. F parallel, you can calculate because F is given, angle is given, then you can calculate F parallel. Displacement is given in the question, then put it there. You can calculate the work done by tractor on the sled. What about the work done by the friction force? This is the direction of the displacement to the right side. This is the direction of the friction force to the left side. Just write the work, cosine phi. What is the angle between this displacement and friction force? The angle is 180 degrees, then the result is minus Fk times displacement. Displacement is given 20 meter, kinetic friction force is given, then you can calculate work done by kinetic friction on this sled and its load. Any question? Okay, then let me continue with the relation between work and speed of the object. The work done by the net force acting on the object on a particle as it moves is called the total work okay v total here we have very important information with green color i will go into detail but first of all i would like to summarize it particle on the left side with the speed v1 its mass is m and its initial position is x1, and we apply a force, a net force on this object, and then now this is the second position of the object, and this is the second velocity of the object, okay? So now we have different speed, and this is the displacement vector. The position of the object is changed from x1 to the x2. If v total is positive, we have discussed the positive work, we have discussed the negative work and zero work. If the work is positive, then the particle speeds up. If the work is negative, then the particle slows down. And if the work is zero, then it maintains the same speed, okay? So we will discuss the relation between the total work and speed of the particle, speed of the object, this in this part of my lecture. Here we have three conditions, the relationship between the total work done on a body and how the body speed changes. The first case, let me magnify, Okay, here on the left side, this is the hand and it applies a certain force 
on this box. And let's consider that there is no friction between the box and this surface. So we have a frictionless surface and box slides to the right, okay? So at the beginning, it was at rest and then we applied a force and we have certain velocity now, okay? And we have a displacement. So now let's try to draw the free body diagram of this condition for the box. Here we have the free body diagram. This is the weight of the box in downward direction. This is the normal force of the box in upward direction. And here we have the direction of the applied force, push force to the right side. And this is the displacement. It is also to the right side. So what do you see here? Look at this condition. The direction of the force and the direction of the displacement are same, okay? So both of them are along the positive x direction, let's say. So here we have a positive work, okay? We have discussed this one and the particle is speeding up. It was at rest at the beginning and after this force, the particle is speeding up. So we have positive work and the particle is speeding up. Now let's come to the second condition. We have a box and this box is moving. It has certain initial velocity, let's say, and it is moving to the right side with some certain velocity and you are applying a force which has opposite direction to its initial velocity. Okay, now what about this condition? Let's again draw the free body diagram. This is the weight of the box downward direction, normal force applied by the surface to the box upward direction. This is the direction of the force, push force on the box, okay? And then this is the displacement. So look at the direction of the force along the x-axis and the direction of the displacement. Since they are opposite to each other, we have a negative work here. In addition to that, look at this one. At the beginning, this box had certain velocity. I applied an opposite force in this direction to the left, okay? Then the velocity will be decreased. The particle is slowing down. So the network, total work acting on this box is negative. Then the block slows down. Now the final question. Again, on the right side, we have a box and we have a frictionless surface. And at the beginning, this box has certain velocity. It is moving to the right side with some certain velocity on a frictionless surface. And now I apply a push force in this direction. Okay, let's consider along the negative y direction. Okay, now what about the velocity of the object? So here I have weight, weight of the box, acting on the object and this F is the push force applied by this hand and this is the normal force applied by this surface on this box, okay? So this is the displacement. This box had a certain velocity at the beginning and it was moving along the right direction, okay? and we have applied this force. So it goes to the right side because the surface is frictionless. So displacement is along the positive x direction, let's say, okay? So what about the net force acting on this object? The net force acting on this object is zero, okay? And there is no displacement along the y-axis, okay? You see, we have many forces along the y-axis, 
but we don't have any displacement along the y-axis. For this reason, this force applied by hand does not work on this box. So the total work done on the block during a displacement, during this displacement to the right side is zero. So here we have zero total work, then the blocks speed stays the same, okay? Here we, the box continues to its movement with same speed. Here on B, the box is slowing down, and here on the left side in A, the box is speeding up. These are the three conditions and the relation between the speed of the object and the total work done on this object. Any question with this transparency? Okay, now let's try to get a relation between total work and speed and discuss the situation here. So at the beginning, on the left side, we have a box and it has certain velocity, V1, okay? You can consider it is at rest or it has certain V1 velocity, it doesn't matter. And this box has mass of M. This is the initial position of the box X1. And we apply a net force on this box. And due to this net force, we have displacement along the positive X direction, let's say. This is the direction of the displacement. And now the box has a different velocity, V2, okay? Since the net force and the displacement are in the same direction, the work is positive, then the particle is speeding up, okay? Now, let's try to write this net force with this one, F net force acting on this box is given with mass times acceleration along the x-axis, x acceleration, okay? And remember the formula from the chapter two, this formula, look at this one in chapter two, square of final velocity is equal to square of initial velocity plus two times acceleration times displacement of the object, okay? And apply this rule in this condition. Look at this one here on the right side, x minus x zero. What is this? Final position, initial position. Final position minus initial position. So instead of this one, I can use s here, this green color. Okay, displacement. Put this S here, then instead of Vx, we have V2, final velocity. Instead of V0x, we have V1, initial velocity. Put them here, then finally we have this relation. Okay, I have just used this equation, 2.13, and now I have this form. This S is displacement of the box. From this equation, you can take the acceleration. So take this V1 square to the left side and divide this one with 2S. Now here we have acceleration of the box. V2 square minus V1 square over 2S. This S is displacement. So multiply this part of the equation with m and multiply this part of the equation with m. Let me write, nothing changes. So here I have m times ax. What is m times ax? This is the force, net force acting on the object, right? This one. So it is equal to m here, times V2 square minus V1 square over 2S. You see, here we have S displacement. 
take take this S and put here. So on the left side, now I have F times S. This equation is equal to F, and I take this S to the left side. F times S is equal to one half m v2 square minus one half m v1 square. I open this equation. What do you see here? What is f times s? f times s. What is this? This is work. Okay, this is work. What about one half m v2 square minus one half m v1 square? So this is the total work on this box, and this is the final velocity, and this is the initial velocity. So we have found a relation between work and velocity of the object. Okay, now we will use it. This term here, one half m, v2 square is given with the final kinetic energy of the box. This one here, one half m v1 square is given with the initial kinetic energy of the object. Okay, now we will continue with the kinetic energy. Any question here? Okay, then let me continue. The kinetic energy of a particle or the energy of motion of a particle is called kinetic energy, okay? So here we have a term, energy of motion. Why we use this definition? If the motion is zero, if the velocity is zero, then there is no kinetic energy. So kinetic energy is the energy of motion of a particle, okay? So what do you see here? This kinetic energy is also a scalar quantity. It is not a vector, okay? And another important thing here, very important one, kinetic energy can never be negative. It is zero only when the particle is at rest. So here within this equation, let's consider velocity is zero. Then kinetic energy will be zero. Let's consider that the particle is moving along the negative y direction with some certain velocity. Even if you write here a negative number for the velocity, since you are taking the square of this velocity, the result will be positive. So kinetic energy can never be negative. It is always positive or it is zero only when the particle is at rest. Don't forget this one. And the SI unit of kinetic energy is the Joule. Remember the work. Work is also given in Joule, and I will discuss the unit consistency in between. So now let me discuss the kinetic energy. Do you have any question here? Okay, then let me continue with the different situations of kinetic energy. As I told you, the kinetic energy is a scalar quantity and it does not depend on the direction of the motion. Here I have two objects, two boxes. One is here, the other one is here. And this object, this box has certain mass m and it has velocity v. The direction of the velocity is this one, the magnitude is v. And here on the right side, I have another box with the same mass and with the same speed. I mean, the magnitude of the velocity is the same as this one, but the direction of the velocity is perpendicular to the direction of this velocity on the left side. So what about the kinetic energy of this box on the left side? What about the kinetic energy of this box on the right side? So kinetic energy formula is one half mv square. So since both boxes have same mass 
and same speed, okay, then they have same kinetic energy. Kinetic energy does not depend on the direction of the motion. It depends on the mass. It depends on the speed of particle. Then let me continue with the relation between mass and kinetic energy. Here again, we have two objects. The first one has mass of M. The second one on the right side has mass of 2m and they have same magnitude of velocity and same direction. So since the mass of the box or object on the right side has 2m twice the mass, same speed twice the kinetic energy, okay? This object has higher kinetic energy, although they have same speed. Why? Here, instead of m, you have to write 2m for this box on the right side, and then you will have two times bigger kinetic energy compared to the box on the left side. This is the relation between kinetic energy and mass. And now, Let's investigate the relation between velocity and kinetic energy. Again, we have two boxes, but now we have identical boxes. This box on the left side has mass of M. This box on the right side, mass of M. But this box on the right side has velocity of 2V twice the speed, okay? Same mass twice the speed. So what about the kinetic energy? Instead of V, you have to write 2V now and four times the kinetic energy on the right side. Let me write this one. So this is the kinetic energy of this box, which is given one half M V square. And here, the kinetic energy of the box on the right side one half m instead of v now we have two v okay and square of it then finally one half m four v square okay so this kinetic energy is four times bigger than the kinetic energy here any question and let me continue with work and energy theorem. We have already discussed all the things. So let me go back to this transparency. Here we have found work V, which is equal to F times S. And this work is related to the final kinetic energy minus initial kinetic energy of the particle. We have already discussed this one. So the total work done on particle, done by net force, is given with final kinetic energy minus initial kinetic energy, and which is equal to delta K, change in the kinetic energy. So this is the work energy theorem, work done by the net force on a particle equals to the change in the particle's kinetic energy. So what about the force here? We are talking about net force. Where is the force here? Force is given here. Force times displacement, okay? So the relation between work and force and the relation between work and kinetic energy, okay? And change in kinetic energy. So what about the unit of work? The unit of work is Joule, okay? And on the right side, we should have Joule, okay? Then let's check it. The work is given with this expression, F times S. So work, let me write down here, work is given with F times S. What about the unit of work? It is Joule. What about the unit of force? It is Newton. 
What about the unit of displacement, meter? And what about the unit of force? Unit of force is given with kilogram times meter square. Why? Because force is given with M times A. Okay, instead of force, you can write M times A. M is given with kilogram. Acceleration is given with meter per square second. And this is the displacement, M. Okay, so finally, what we have here, one kilogram meter square over second square. Okay, this is the unit of the work, right? And it is equal to joule. So what about the unit of the kinetic energy? Now, just write the kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is given with one half m v square. What is the unit of mass? Kilogram. What is the unit of velocity? Meter per second. If you take the square of it, the unit of kinetic energy, kilogram meter square per second square, and it is equal to joule. Okay, look at this one. So there is a unit consistency. Any question? Then I will finish my lecture with two examples from the book. Let me start with this one here. Forces on a hammerhead, the 200 kilogram steel hammerhead of a pile driver. This is the pile driver system, and this is the hammerhead here. Is lifted three meter above the top of a vertical I-beam being driven into the ground. This is the distance between the hammerhead and I-beam, three meter. What is this I-beam? If you look from this side, it is like I, okay? Or if you rotate it by 90 degrees, it will be like this. H-beam or I-beam, okay? It has different names as much as I know. So this is used in civil engineering. Now let me continue. The hammerhead is then dropped. This is dropped, driving the I-beam 7.4 centimeter deeper into the ground, okay? The vertical guide rails, this is the vertical guide rail, exert a constant 60 Newton friction force on the hammerhead. So there is a friction force between the rails on both sides and the surface of this hammerhead. Use the work energy theorem to find the speed of the hammerhead just as it hits the I-beam. So the distance is three meter. This hammerhead will gain some certain speed and what is the speed here? Just stay in contact, okay? And the second question, what is the average force the hammerhead exerts on the I-beam? So this hammerhead will hit on this I-beam when it reaches to this surface. So what is the force applied by a hammerhead on this I-beam? This is the second question and the air resistance is ignored. Only we have friction force between hammerhead and the rails. So now just divide this problem into the three parts. This is the first part, the position one or the point one. The hammerhead here is at rest, okay? At the beginning. And then it is released. So what kind of forces acting on this hammerhead at point one? Free body diagram at point one. There is a weight of the hammerhead and there is a friction force due to the surfaces between hammerhead and rays and friction force is given 60 Newton. And this is the direction of the velocity, okay? This is the free body diagram for falling hammerhead. And now, after a certain time, this hammerhead reaches to this I-beam here. Then, what about the free body diagram at this position? 
Again, this is the free body diagram of the hammerhead. Okay. This is the weight of the hammerhead. This is the friction force applied by these rails. And this is the normal force applied by this I beam. So this hammerhead applies a force on this I beam. And then this I beam applies a back force due to the Newton's third law. So this is the normal force applied by I beam. Okay. So these are the forces acting on the hammerhead at this point three. Okay. What about point three? Let's consider, let me draw point three here. Point three is this one. This placement between point two and point three is 7.4 centimeter. Actually, it is given here, but very small to see. Okay. So where is it? The hammerhead is then dropped, driving the I beam 7.4 centimeter deeper into the ground. Okay. This is the displacement of the hammerhead and I beam together 7.4 centimeter. And we will discuss this condition. So these are the free body diagrams for point one and point two. Now let's continue with point one. So what about the total work on the hammerhead between point one and two? I am looking for the work on hammerhead between point one and point two. So what is the work? Force times displacement. Displacement is given between point one and point two, three meter. What about the force? So net force acting on the hammerhead can be found by using free body diagram here. Then you can calculate total work. So total force weight minus F. If you choose this direction is positive Y, then you can take positive this one. You can take negative this one. So weight minus F. What about displacement between one and two points? It is three meter, so weight is given, mass is given 200 kilogram, then you can find weight and friction force is given 60 Newton. Put them here. So the total force acting on the hammerhead between point one and two is 1,900 Newton. And the total displacement of the hammerhead is three meter. Then the total work on the hammerhead between points one and two is 5,700 Joule. Now I know the energy, okay? I know the work. So from the work energy theorem, we have learned here, V total is equal to K2 minus K1. V total is equal to K2 minus K1. And what is K1? Initial kinetic energy of the hammerhead. Initial kinetic energy of the hammerhead is zero. Why? Because the velocity of the hammerhead at the beginning at position one is zero. Then V total is equal to the final kinetic energy of the hammerhead. Then from this expression, I can find the final velocity of the hammerhead when it just hits to the I beam. Okay. Now let's discuss the second condition. What about the V total between point two and three? Between point two and three. What about the displacement? 7.4 here. What about the forces? Forces are given here then I can calculate V total. So V total is given weight minus F friction minus N normal force acting on this hammerhead applied by I beam. Then displacement, okay? It is equal to final kinetic energy of the hammerhead at position three minus initial kinetic energy of the hammerhead at point two, okay? So 
from this expression, I can take n. I don't know the n. So what about the weight? I know of, I have calculated it here because I know of the mass. Mass is given within the question. What about the friction force? It is given in the question. What about the final kinetic energy of the hammerhead? At point three, at position three, final kinetic energy of the hammerhead is zero because they stop together, okay? They move 7.4 centimeter together and position three, they stop. Then the final kinetic energy at point three is zero. Then initial kinetic energy, we have calculated this one, okay? When the hammerhead touches to the surface of this I-beam, we have calculated the kinetic energy, put them here. Displacement is given 7.4 centimeter. You have to convert it to the meter, okay? Then you can calculate normal force here. So what was the normal force? The normal force is applied by I-beam on this hammerhead. So this is reaction force, then the action force applied by hammerhead on this I-beam will be in the same amount, but with opposite direction. Then there is a downward force applied by hammerhead on I-beam with the same magnitude and opposite direction. Any question here? Okay. This is the last example of this lecture today. Conceptual example 6.5 from the book, Comparing Kinetic Energies. Here, we have two ice bolts. One has mass of M, the other one has mass of 2M, and there is a wind. Now, let me read the question. So, the surface is frictionless, it is given. The two ice bolts have masses M and 2M. The ice bolts have identical sails. So the wind exerts the same constant force on each ice bolt. They start from rest. They have zero velocity at the beginning. And cross the finish line a distance S away. So this is the finish line and this is the total displacement of the bolts, okay? Which ice bolt crosses the finish line with greater kinetic energy? So force acting on this ice bolt is given with F, and the force acting on this ice bolt is given with F, same F. And they have same displacement, let me write down the work done by wind on this ice bolt. The work is given with F times S. Since the direction of the force and the direction of the displacement are same, then this is positive work, okay? So what about the force? Force is same, which is given in the question. Displacement is same, so the wind will do same work on this ice boat and on this ice boat, okay? So what about the kinetic energy? So question asks, which one has greater kinetic energy? Since they have same works, they will have same delta K right and what about delta k k2 minus k1 k2 minus k1 right so what about the k1 for both ice boats k1 is zero okay then they will have same final kinetic energy at the finish point okay what about their final velocities? So in order to find the final velocities, just 
have a look this equation m v2 square final velocity so they have same kinetic energy but this one has bigger mass then it will have lower velocity okay at this finish point but they will have same kinetic energy do you have any question here then with this example i finish my lecture and on thursday we will continue with work and energy with varying forces so within this part of my lecture we have discussed forces are constant okay and sometimes the magnitude of force can change so what do you see here the force is increasing with some certain relation then what we will do you can consider like this within chapter two we have discussed constant acceleration and we have discussed the situations for non-constant acceleration so mechanism is more or less same so in the next lecture we will discuss the non-constant force situations acting on objects and we will deal with work and energy any question take care of yourself